Good evening. How's it going? Happy, happy to hear it. <laughs> I'm just going to say a couple of words briefly. Um, I think that when you're a teenager, the first time you hear a record you love by a band you've never heard before, you love the record. And then maybe the second or third time that happens, you start to love the band. And that's certainly what happened with myself and the gentleman we're about to meet. I think uh, the first time I saw the go-betweens was opening for Aztec Camera at the Birmingham Odeon in 1984. And I was only really there because I was a huge Aztec Camera fan. But I was very intrigued by this louche, kind of maybe slightly aloof camp-looking guy in the band who was throwing these really great shapes next to this slightly more kind of straightforward-looking guy. They, they both had great songs. I didn't really know who was in charge. And maybe by the end of this evening, we still won't know who was in charge. But um, like a lot of people here, I sort of, I fell in love with every single record that this group made. And uh, you know, the, each of their records are sort of coordinates by which you could measure the process, progress or lack of it in your own life. <laughs> and he's still making great music and I'd like to welcome him on stage, Mr. Robert Forster. Good evening, Robert. Hello, Dick. How are you? Good. Are you going to start with a song? I, I, I am. Mm. Start with a song. I've uh, I got a, a uh, oh gee, those lights are strong, aren't they? Um, I got a um, a plectrum. Right. Yeah. yeah. On this side, it reads Johnny Ma. <laughs> On the other one, it's Set the Boy Free. It's a promotional uh, plectrum for his book. Johnny is with us tonight. She's 
from the village. She's my, 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 she's my, 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 she's my god now, she's my god now, she's my god now, she's my god now, all right. song we're here to amongst other things talk about your new book Grant and I which I understand is already charted it, it is it's it's number 11 <laughs> in um, in the uh, autobiographies uh, section uh, after the first week I knew you'd chart one day yep. <laughs> um, and that was... it wasn't gonna be with music <laughs> That was, um, and that was a song that ultimately persuaded Grant to join your band. Yeah, that was, um, that song, uh, which is why I wanted to play it, is a starting point uh, for, it was the first good song that I wrote. Uh, I wrote it in 1977. Uh, and I was, I was 20 when I wrote that, and I'd been writing songs for about a year before that. And that was the first good one. That's the first one that survived. And I was in a band called The Goddos. And we did, um, we did three gigs in, in two years. And uh, the last two gigs we did at the end of 1977. And uh, the, I, I wrote Karen and then, and then we, um, The Goddos, which was a bass player and a drummer, we, we rehearsed it and then we played it at a, a Battle of the Bands show and Grant was in the audience and he he saw me he saw the band play it and uh, I know he he loved the song and it, so it was sort of the first thing that I that I sort of showed him of what I could do and he responded and uh, just uh, like a couple of weeks later when when we started the band when the Goddos broke up and he bought a bass and I showed him some notes like very early on it was like when are you going to show me karen and uh so in a way it's the start of the group and it's the start of me as a, a songwriter and the book is obviously um it touches on other things but the the the, the central as you know as the title indicates it's 
I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a love story in a way. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, it's yeah, yeah. Um, people call it that. Um, I. It is. I mean, there, there was a love, you know, between Grant and I. Um, but I, I saw it more as a, a shared artistic adventure and a great deep friendship. Um, and so, what what people saw outside of it. Um, and a love story, I I can I can understand it, but within within between him and I, um, yeah, it's as I described it, I think. But there's a kind of those kind of early, and you say yourself in the book that there's the 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 the, the period in the the moment in the arc of anyone's career that really fascinates you is just before just before the breakthrough, yeah, the cusp yeah. of the breakthrough. Yeah, tell yeah. tell me why that why for you that is that the sweet spot. I think for every band, uh, the first year or two is is one they always look back to. I think it's the, the most romantic part of any band's career because a lot of the first things happen there. You like you obviously play your first gig, um, you get might get your first positive reaction. You know you don't really probably play much out of town, so your friends are seeing you, your family's seeing you. You've just started being in a rock band. And it's very romantic, and it's very innocent, and um, and I think it's it's something that every band, um, you know, after ten or twelve years, uh, or twenty years, thirty years, always, always, every band I've ever known looks back at their start, and you read it in interviews as well, and they love the start of the band. After that, it it's great, um, but often hard work begins and repetition begins where for the first year or 18 months, it's all fresh. One quote in the book that intrigues me is, uh, is, I'll just read it out, how you imagine yourself is as important as talent when writing songs. Um, yeah, I, because I think you, for a songwriter, you, you've got to project into what you write. Um, you've got to see yourself um, at least that's what I do. I, you know, like when I when, when I'm sitting at a at a um, with a guitar in a room, uh, and I'm trying to write songs, I have to think of myself as some sort of hero for for doing it, and for it gives me the self confidence. I, I have a very romantic disposition and definition of of being a singer songwriter, uh, almost to a cliche, ridiculous degree, um, but it gets me through. Well, you know, it's like a writer, you know, like a writer, you know, like thinks, okay, you know, like I'm, I'm in the woods and I'm in a cabin and, and you know, I've got a, a desk and, and there's no one for 10 miles and that's, that's the way a writer can see themselves and, and it might be true that, you know, they could be in the city, uh, in a cafe, but that's the way that they perceive themselves and it helps them do the work and, and I think most, most uh, singer songwriters are like that. What would be an example of a song? I mean, what you're describing is a kind of romantic kind of role play almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what would be an example of a song uh, of yours that would the first that might spring to mind, which is a kind of perfect embodiment of that sort of method, if you like? Uh, probably um, like uh, very again, it's very early in the band, like when I wrote "People Say," and. Uh, it's it's sort of the next song on Beyond Karen because for the first like 18 months of the band's life, um, I was writing virtually all the material, and um, and so all my songs were very much inspired by like the Velvet Underground and uh, Jonathan Richmond and the Ramones and television and Talking Heads, and um, and and garage, so 60s pop, so everything like uh, oh, oh, my guitar's dead. Oh. Um, I'll, I'll just be going back to the guitar suddenly, um, and um, like you know, like Lee Remick, uh, you know. So. It was all that, and it was like it was all quick, and you know, and guitar, you know. And then when I wrote, um, people say it, it was just, uh, I'll play it, um, but. It was a time when, when I really felt that I could, that 
there was no one else in Brisbane who was, you know, it, and, and this is, you know, like, it's ego-driven. And that's why, you know, like, I think there's, you know, if I'm sitting here in this house in Brisbane in 1978 playing the guitar, I'm the best person in town writing songs at the moment. Like, like, um, and I, I felt capable of writing great songs. Uh, it's like, you know, you go 10 years later, I'm living in Highbury Barn and, um, and I'm in an attic and, you know, and I'm, by that time, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, drinking wine and smoking cigarettes, you know, but I've got a guitar and, and again, I've, I write, you know, the house that Jack Kerouac built or the Clark sisters and I think there's no one else doing this in this town, you know, and, and added to the, you know, romance, I'm in an attic and, you know, it's just sort of, you need that, you know, you, 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 at least I do. I, I, and, and, um, so, I mean, that's, that's, and it still goes on to today, you know. I mean, you talk, you talk that very seriously. I mean, Tallulah is, the, the whole Tallulah phase is a great example of you sort of almost, you know, changing your appearance yeah. in order to, to look like, presumably like the artist that you wanted to be, or the artist... Yeah, I was, I was trying to, to be, like at that time, you know, like when I dyed my hair and I weighed about, you know, seven stone. <laughs> and um, that's the way, as, as eccentric and as wild as I looked, that's the way that I perceive my songs. You know, like if you're writing, you know, with, songs with titles like When People Are Dead and The Spirit of a Vampire, then that's pretty much how you think that that uh, you are, you know. I mean, but that's the only time in my life, like at that time was the only time I, I looked into mirrors and I'd see myself and I'd go, I know you're in there somewhere. You know, like I'd look at myself and I'd, I'd taken my appearance and, and the way I was behaving was so far away from myself that I could barely see myself in my reflection. Um, and that had to change, but that's where I was at that time, writing those songs. And that's what five years in London had done to me, basically. Were you... <laughs> it, it can, yeah. London in the 80s as well, which must have been very different. Too. Yeah, it was. Did you draw, were you drawing... Uh, were you eliciting concern from your friends and bandmates at this time who saw you so transformed? There was, but we were all in it together. And because you're seeing each other all the time, you don't really notice. Um, we were a very dynamic group. So it wasn't like, you know, I might be going through all these physical changes and, and look like some sort of raked rock star. But, you know, like I had Lindy on one, you know, beside that Amanda. You know, I had Robert Vickers in, you know, the suit and the 1966 haircut. You know, I had Grant, you know, and so I had really strong people around me. And so it didn't stand out as much. And I think they, they knew me uh, well enough by then to know, um, you know, like the, the changes that I, was, that I was going through. I didn't think, I remember the first time I saw you, I didn't think bands were allowed to look like you, like that, you know, the, the kind of the combination, like Lindy on drums, playing yeah. drums in a very particular way as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That came, that came to me, um, I mean, that's just the way the, the band formed, you know, like Grant and I were, you know, started the band and then Lindy joined in 1980. But I, I think it goes back to really, um, I think a key point for me was seeing the Velvet Underground for the first time, like I bought their, their first album in 1975, and seeing those five people, like just completely transfixed me, you know, like, because everyone else was just four or five boys, you know, like the Kings, the Beatles, the Who, everyone looked, although they're all different, they looked the same. And, and this was a band, I mean, um, you know, n not only were two women in it, but also, you know, like the way John Cale looked was just amazing. You know, like that black hair coming down, that beard, and and Lou looks great, and Sterling looks great, and then there's two women in the band, and they don't just look like mid '60s sort of go-go girl types. You know, there's there's Nico, uh, you know, the blonde goddess, and there's Mo Tucker, the tomboy, and it, it just like I looked at these five people, and it completely just shattered the way I thought a rock band could look. And so, maybe subconsciously, they just went in. And so, when you know people say, "Oh, you know, oh, Lindy joined the band," and you know, like she's 
um, you know, like she was six years older than me, and you know, feminist and and uh, a very strong character. You know, it goes back to that away to that Velvet Underground thing of like it's got to be really intense, great people in the band. And so when I was, you know, like this period that you described now, um, you know, by that time we were five people in 1987 and there were two women in the band, you know, like we'd, we'd come in this miraculous, unplanned way to reflect, you know, the Velvet Underground in, in, um, in 66, you know, 65. You look, I guess the thing in common with both yourself and yourselves and the Velvets is that you both look like bands that only a kind of rather sort of brilliant author would have dreamed up in a yeah. way. Um, I feel rather guilty because I've kind of led you away from the point, point, point yeah. at which you're about to play people say. No, 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 no. You know, keep keep going with, with, with where we're going. Of course, we're in Tallulah now, so you would also have the option of maybe kind of going oh, yeah, okay. to oh, Tallulah. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I can play anything from Tallulah. Um, mm -hmm. oh, okay. I'll play Jack Carraway, I'll, I'll, but I haven't played this in a long time. Um, but, you know, like going back to that, um, that time, like in 87 and 88, um, I'd meet people, I met people in the 90s um, and, and, and the, the noughties who, who met me then, and, and, and it would always be strange. I'd meet people in bands, and they'd go to me, um, uh, we've met before. And I'd go, oh yeah, and then they'd look at me and they'd go, but you wouldn't remember. <laughs> and uh, that's always a, a scary thing when that happens, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> I don't know if I'll get all of this. You and I together Nothing showing at all in a darkened cinema. I'll give you pleasure in your store. Wanna give you tenderness, my affection too. If it's through clenched teeth, well, that's what you've driven me to. Want us to be lovers. Want us to be friends? I want it like it's the living end. Keep me away from her. Keep me away from her. Keep me away from her. With your kittens. The patchwork quilt. Oh no, what am I doing here in the house Jack Kerouac built? This white magic, bad rock and roll. Your friend there says he's the gatekeeper to my soul. The velvet curtains. Chinese bell with friends like these baby you're damned as well keep me away from her keep me away from her in the house that Jack built throw off that complacency
one of the more concerning songs in many ways on uh, Tallulah. Um, there were three singles released from that album, and none of them were written by you. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the go between some of the band that you formed, and I know that you were looking for, for someone to be on an equal footing with, but nevertheless. That... Yeah, well, um, I, I always knew Grant was going to write songs, you know, like right from the word go. Uh, he was the most, you know, like creative, um, intelligent. Uh, person that I've met and and the, and easily the most ambitious and so if he was going to come he he wanted to be a film director and I and and so I just knew and he wrote poetry he wrote short stories you know when he was 18 19 so someone like that when they get an instrument in their hand is not just going to plot around you know like on bass notes I knew Grant was going to write songs and uh, and he did and and um, and he was just had a, a you know, his voice was far more um, uh, not conventional in a way than mine. Um, he had a, a melodic sense um, that was perhaps a little bit more commercial orientated at times than mine. And he was far more prolific as a songwriter than me. So you know, like that will set him up to perhaps you know at this particular time. Um, be writing songs like that and, and, and be, you know, like um, most of the A-sides at that time were his, yeah. And the, you were sort of, that was just the deal that you kind of struck with yourself. Right? Yeah, it, it was, but around that time, you know, like, I, it was a frustrating, like, Tallulah is the one album in, in the band's catalogue which to me is like what, it could have been something that it wasn't. You know, like, I, and, and it, you know, it goes back to what we were describing I just want to go into a studio and just sort of blast away and make an album in, in a week, you know, and I didn't want to do the patchwork, you know, trying to, you know, I mean, 80s recording, you know, like just piece by piece. But, it, you know, it was something I couldn't get through. Um, no matter how strong a presence I was in the band, I couldn't get that through. Um, and so, um, and, and you know, like, and so it's, it's an album that... Um, the 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 one that that um, could have me could have been, but um, if Grant was writing those songs and then you know like I I I played on them and, and I was perfectly happy with the way that the the group was going to go and also you know like he he wrote he wrote um, you know like Bachelor Kisses you know and then so on the, the the next album I wrote you know Spring Rain and Head Full of Steam you know so. It, 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 it went back and forward a, um, a bit. I wanted to ask you about Spring Rain. It's um, it's such a... Uh, reading the opening sort of section of the book, yeah. you know, the, you, it, you paint such an evocative picture of Brisbane. And, but in, in a way, it's mm -hmm. kind of signposted by, by Spring Rain. Uh, Spring Rain is obviously a sort of a song about being being at a certain point in your life. Yeah. What kind of a person were you? What are you what is the person in Spring Rain? What kind of a person is he? Well, the person in Spring Rain is is me um as an 18-year-old. And so it's me me being I wrote that when I was around 28. And again up in the the attic at, at up at Highbury Barn. And and it was sort of it, it, there was a music a musical uh it was a gradually a gradual sort of sense of classicism in my songwriting that I sort of had in the late 70s and then I, and then post-punk happened and, I, you know, and then it all got cut up and spliced up and then around the mid 80s it started to sort of come back this is what Grant and I thought you know, like, oh, you know like we started to sound a little bit like we did in the late 70s but it's done in a whole different way and so like uh, you know I just wrote this you know like I'm up there in, in um, Highbury Barn like doing that to be fairly simple and, and I wrote it quick where, where a lot of songs on, on on before Hollywood and Spring Hill Fair are almost overwritten you know like over poetic and, and over thought you know but I sort of learned from like um, Drain the Pool for You and, and Park Company that I could write and so it was just like and I just thought I picked up a tip from Grant you know like from, from Catelyn Kane I, I'd never written a song that, that look back, 
um, you know, all my songs were now, I, I, you know, um, all, all of them were, 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 were set in the present. And so Grant wrote Catelyn Kane, and, and I saw, oh, you know, you can go back in time. So I think that's a little bit on this. I just thought, oh, okay, he's written something when he was 12, and I'll write something when I, when I was 18, driving around Brisbane, and, um, and that's what I did. So it's all me as an 18 year old. So, and I just want to keep it. No. Dressed in a white shirt, with my hair combed straight. great musical loves uh, was Creedence Clearwater Revival and and so um, when, when I had that I loved I, I loved the song and I loved writing it so when I was all out of that I just heard Creedence and and um, and I loved you know um, who'll stop the rain have you ever seen the rain and so it became spring rain you know and it's a wonderful song it still sounds wonderful now um, it's um it's interesting. You mentioned it. It's funny that you mentioned it in 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 comparison to Cattle and Cain because yeah. I think you can hold up those two songs and they highlight an an interesting difference in 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 yours and Grant's personalities in terms of the fact that you know Spring Rain paints this picture of this young man who's kind of indignant at how little people yeah. settle for. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and then you've got. Um, Alan Kane, which is, which sort of, is kind of grasping at this just intangible sort of melancholy. Mm, mm, mm. And no, you talk about, go on, sorry. No, no, I mean, that's beautifully put. Um, and, you know, like, and, and, yeah, I mean, that's the difference between Grant and I. And, uh, and his, his, Catelyn Kane, for, you know, for all its, for its beauty, also has sort of a, a quite self-conscious, you know, like a rain of falling cinders. You know, it has a sort of, uh, um, a brilliant, but you know, like self-conscious 
aimed poeticness to it that Grant had. You know, he he was a lover of of formal poetry. So in all of, a lot of his stuff is quite um, there's alliteration and 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 there's a a strive for poeticness. Um, that's in that's in Kevin Kay. So that was one of the first. Um one of the, well, one, obviously a great song. Yeah. One of the early London songs for when you when you sort of moved it moved here sort of yeah. properly. Yeah, that we were living in. Um, we just come over in 982, and uh, we'd been signed by Jeff Travis um, over off trade when when the shop uh, was over over in um, Notting Hill Gate, Labrador Grove. Still uh, there. Yeah, it's well, yeah. And well, see, it was around the it moved around the corner, um, and. Um, and so we, we came over and, and well, uh, we, we were uh, 982 and we made the album, yeah. Um, and, it's and, and we wrote all these songs. We wrote all the songs for, um, before Hollywood quite quickly. Like we were living in a house that was going to be sold. And so we had three floors of a terrace house in Ladbroke Grove where there was no furniture. and. Uh, so it's just like bare carpets and windows, and like we just and like Lindy Grant and I just like we must have had mattresses there, but that was it. We just sleep on the floor, and um, and then we'd wake up in the morning and and I I could virtually have a floor to myself. Grant had a floor, Lindy had a floor, and 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 we we'd, the whole three of us separately would be making music. Lindy would be practicing. I'd be trying to write songs. Grant would be writing songs, and then we'd meet up and we'd just play acoustically, and that went on for about four or five months. The summer of 982 was was the best summer we've ever had here in terms of winter over the next five years. We, uh, in terms of summer, so it was, it was a beautiful summer. We had this this house. We knew that we were going to make an album on Rough Trade, and it was going to bring us attention that we that our first album didn't have. We knew we had a shot. Um, uh, that this would, you know, like the English press was just waiting, was right there, and we knew we had to make a great album, and so we really worked on it. And over the next few months, yeah. a series of sort of extraordinary little things happened in British music. Your old friends and label mates are introduced, had a top ten hit, yeah. and and um, and Aztec Camera and the Smiths were about to become pop stars. Yeah, and um, and Scritti Politti were being talked about yeah. in similar terms. Yeah, I mean you must have just been counting down the seconds until it was your turn. Yeah, we, we were. We, we were. And um, the Smiths were, were, were the year later. Smiths were 83. Um, and we were there in 82 with, with Aztec Camera and um, Scritti Politti. Uh, before were there, the Blue Orchids, the Raincoats. Um, but you could tell that things were starting to go. There was a pressure, not a pressure, but a feeling inside Rough Trade that that late 70s period was over and, and that the charts were coming over and more commercial thing which was I think one of the reasons why Jeff brought us in because he thought that maybe we could um, you know like we were pop in a way um, and so yeah we, we we were in a rough trade and um, the great thing about rough trade was that that, that as a record label that, that Jeff was there um, and knee deep in cassettes because every band in the world wanted to be on the label um, and there was a press department, there was an accountant, there was a booking agency, um, there was a radio plugger, and they were all within like rooms. And so your whole career could be managed in one building. Uh, and so we saw that, and we could see that you know like we had to make a like a genius record. And um, you know, I mean, Grant writing Catherine Kane pushed it through. Well, that was the one that got played on Radio One. It was. It, it, it got a um, it got a, a breakfast uh, radio play. Good old Mike Reed. Yeah, lovely guy. Um, one one other detail that intrigued me was around this time Lindy took a job as a cleaner, which you said for a, for, a, for among others a member of Pink Floyd. Yeah. You didn't mention which one though. I know. I've I've forgotten. It it would have been whichever member in nineteen. We we're living in Fulham, Fulham Palace Road. And it was like we'd we'd made um, before Hollywood in nineteen in, in October eighty two, and it was going to come out in March eighty three. So we just had to get through this winter, and we knew we'd made a, a good record, and people in the rough trade were was very supportive and and 
you know, Cattle and Cam was going to be the first single, but we just had to survive the winter on no money. And also living in that, the house was Nick Cave um, and Tracy Pugh with um, their girlfriends, uh, Anita Lane and Kate Jarrett. So, um, were you like, actually like sharing the kitchen with Nick Cave? Well, he, him and, him and um, uh, it was on Fulton Palace Road and, and he, they just come back from Berlin where, where they'd done, we, we knew them, I should backtrack because we, we'd played shows, with, we'd done two tours with them in Australia. And so they just come back from doing a, 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 a four track EP um, called, I think the bad CDP. And uh, the first track, the first line, is, is hands up who wants to die. <laughs> and so I'm living with someone who's just written a song called Hands Up Who Wants to Die and he's sleeping in our lounge room, uh, Nick Cave and, um, and Tracy. And so they were friends, like, you know, like we, uh, and, uh, but it was very, you know, like that just, they didn't have any money either. So no one had money. So um, Lindy, you know, just to save dignity, you know, like got a, a cleaning job um, and, um, you know, like she's a, you know, fully, besides being, you know, a great drummer, she was a, you know, university educated social worker. But anyway, you know, like she, so she worked as a cleaner. And part of the cleaning duties with her an agency was through a member of Pink Floyd. I think it was in Chelsea. And so I don't know which member of the band. Does anyone know which member of Pink Floyd uh, was in Chelsea? Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's what she was, that's what she was doing. Amazing. Yeah. And you were, and what, what, what does one do, when one lives with Nick Cave, yeah. what does one do in one's downtime with him? Um, well, it was, we, we had a friend called Clinton Walker who was there, and, and Clinton was an Australian uh, uh, rock journalist. And so he passed a rock and roll test to work at the record and tape exchange. You, do you know about this? You, you, I, think, I think I might have taken the tape the same test. I think, anyway, go on. Yeah. Do you know what he was asked? No, 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 but there, like, there's something like 100 questions, and, and Clinton got something like 95 of the 100 questions right, which mean, meant that he could work at the Notting Hill Gate Record and Tape Exchange. And so, so Clinton would bring home records, like he'd bring home five or ten records every day. And, um, and so he'd, he'd bring them, we'd all look forward to Clinton coming home. Um, and then he'd, you know, we had a record player, and we'd just sit around listening to these records, and there's, there's, there's records that really resonate with me to that day because I, I heard them um, in the long winter nights there with everyone you know in the lounge room just listening you know like stuff like it was where I heard um, TB Sheets by Van Morrison which is an extraordinary track um, it was where, where I heard the first time I ever heard Fun House by the Stooges you know um, and so that that used to get thrashed um, Billy Swan I Can Help album wow um, and, um, yeah, so, you know, like, it was like, uh, Miami by The Gun Club, which is probably a more obvious one, but, you know, like, we, we just be plowing through records. So you mentioned in the book uh, writing a song with, uh, the, with the same tempo as TB Sheets. Yeah, yeah, TB Sheets, I did, I, TB Sheets, because everything I was writing was really quick, um, around, and, and post-punk was, was very fast, you know, like, everyone's... <laughs> You know, it's all, it's all, and people yelping, you know, the singing, um, and screaming, and, you know, like, and, and everything's broken, and someone's smashing a drum kit, or hitting a, you know, like a, a, a gas cylinder with a hammer, and there's drills going on, and, um, and so, and it was all, all quite quick, and, and then, um, the, the Van Morrison song was great, because, um, it goes for about eight minutes, and it's about, it's an extraordinary song. It's, it, it's a recording he made just before Astral Weeks. And uh, he did these demos. And, um, and he never re-recorded TV Sheets. Um, and it's like a, uh, he goes and he's visiting someone who's got TB, like the, the eye in the, the song, the, the Van character. And it's all about breathing the air around this person as they visit them in, in hospital. You know, it's a really weird, fantastic uh, concept for a song. And the whole thing is just, you know. It just goes on like this. Two chords, eight minutes. Right? And that's it. 
great, it's great, it's really recorded well. And so I'm listening to this and I'm going, Van's just doing like two chords, eight minutes, the groove works and he's telling a story and it was, you know, like, that's great. And then about, um, about, eight, uh, about, you know, like a year later, so I write, during the pool view and and so I just got that I knew I had to slow down and, and I got that off off TV sheets you can carry on playing it if you want um, are you asking me to play these songs I, 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 I might get a verse done remember your name evidently Imagine that song, Draining the Pool for You. I can imagine you showing that to Grant, and I can imagine Grant with his sort of his sort of literary sensibility yeah. being impressed by that one. Yeah, he did, and he and, and he wrote some great um, guitar lines. You know, like when I, you know, like looking back, whenever I do at you know at the Go Betweens albums that we've done, one of the things that always hits me is his great guitar lines to my songs. You know, like, he was just a, a riff master. I mean, you know, like, the, you, know, you know, all that. I can't play them, you know. Genius, you know, like, because all I'm playing him is this. So he could have come up with anything. Because that's, that's all I've got. And it, nah, nah, bah, bah, bah. And, but that was his genius, you know, like, like, you know, like Park Company, you listen to Park Company, and it's just like, it's just all these genius riffs all the way through, and it goes all the way through, like, right up until, I can remember when we did, like, Here Comes the City, and, um, and like, the fast forward to 2005, and you listen to his lead break in that, it's amazing, you know, like, and, and like, and then when we're recording that, like, in 2005, like, you know, like, a, And 
if you listen after the 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 second line that I sing, you hear this sort of one note. And he just came up with that in the studio, you know. Like, and it's just like so. So he can do all of the like nice, beautiful, you know, riffs. Um, but then, but then Grant had the sensibility of like one note. And it was like, and like I was there with Mark Wallace, the the, the producer, you know, who did Sixteen Lovers Land too. And you know, Grant sitting there with a the guitar, and like Mark and I just looking at each other and going, "Wow." You know, like that, and it just sat in the mix. He played it softly. It's just this bush. You can actually hear it on the record. It's beautiful. And and so, like Grant, Grant really gave a lot to my songs in terms of their, and and it's typical of him, melodic intent, melodic integrity that he gave to my songs is something I always hear um, when I listen to records. He when you gave each other, when you sort of played each other, sort of new songs. Mm -hmm. How did how did the one either of you know that you'd really impressed the other one? By by immediately we were we were stupidly non-verbal to each other, um, and you know probably a male thing, you know like, um, and and but the most thing would be um, play it again. Okay, let's let's go. And so, what had happened when we're songwriting is is that he would. If he wrote the song, I'd have to come up with some like guitar lines um, and just sort of um, riffy things. And if I wrote the song, and so I'm strumming it, then he's the, the sort of lead player. Um, and so if it was a song of his, then it'd be, okay, let's play it again. And I'd be watching his hands and I'd start to try and do, you know, like instead of, you know, I'd be, you know, like just trying to sort of do things around chords. And um, and then he'd do the, the same to me, and so it'd just be an instant. Let's play it again. Yeah. Um, but but the thing with 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 Grant and I talk about it in the book. There were there was a time in two thousand and two, and this was so typical of him, is is that he he was very. If you didn't see him for six weeks, he'd have seven songs ready to go. Do you know what I mean? Um, and and all of them, he was convinced were great. And and. He'd play them, he, so he'd play, like this happened um, like in 2002, uh, no, 2004. I went over to his house and and he, I hadn't seen him for, you know, like um, a couple of weeks or months and he had six songs. And and the first song he played to me was, um, he said, oh, this sounds, you know, like a little bit like um, Jumping Joe. No, th this sounds like a little bit like The Stones. And he played me a song, totally, he was totally convinced about it, and it was sounded very similar to Jumpin' Jack Flash. And so I have to sort of go, mm-hmm, you know, like, and then he'd go through them, and he had the melody, and then, then the fifth song, he plays me Finding You, you know. And as soon as he started to play it, it was like none of the other four, and I, just, I, I was just like, this is it, I'm hearing it. But... Typical of Grant, and you know there, there, there was no intention, bad intention with this. He didn't play it first, you know. He played it fourth or fifth of the, and and, and we never heard the sixth. <laughs> I don't know what that other song was, but because um, we stopped there, and I, I just went, that's and and the other songs were good, but they weren't great. But Finding You um, was was incredible. And, and I just said, okay, let's go. And, and as I said, we never we never got to the sixth song. So that's that's the way it was. Like something would happen, and it, and whatever forced the other to go, okay, I'll let's start. And did he, did he just not? Did he leave it so late with finding you that because he didn't necessarily regard? I, it as look, I th I think I thought about it. Like that's one that one thing you know, like not one thing, but it's something I've really you know, someone plays you six songs. It's like you know if if you just sat down with Bowie in 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 '74 and he played you four, you know I'm gonna play you five or six songs, and he played Rebel Rebel five, and you'd go, that's obviously the best song, <laughs> but but for Bowie it it might have been that's the order he wanted to play them in, that's the way he felt, and and Grant didn't go oh, now now I'm gonna play the good one. It was like. He just started strumming, and as soon as he started strumming, uh, I'm going to, yeah. anyway, as soon as he, uh, I, I, just the way he played guitar, you know, it, it had that McLennan strum, 
and I just went, here we go, here we go. And, and it went by so slow, and I was so conscious of it, that by the second chorus, I was just going, I hope you've got a great middle eight for this. <laughs> you know, I, I, and then he went into it, you know. Went into that, you know, like because it's all sort of down here, and you know, and then then suddenly, and then the lightning flash, and here comes, we can't even find out. Da 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 it was a great moment, and and that's the, the I you know I sh I picked it up and I ran with it, but I should have just jumped out of my chair and gone, you know, like that's one of the best five songs you've ever written. That is just magnificent. I didn't, but the best I could do was like, you know, let's go, let's go. But presumably that was even that was maybe not. You tell me. It was that more of a reaction than he would if the roles were reversed. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I played him the same day, or, or the, I played him Darlinghurst Nights. You know, like I'm, I, I play a five-minute masterpiece to him, <laughs> and like you know, like it's just I'll play that later, and and I play it, you know, like the first time, I, you know, and I've got all the lyrics, and it, and I, I just know this one of the best songs that I've ever played, played to him, and he just goes, I think we could work with that, <laughs> and I just went, and, I, and that was a moment where I thought, you know, you. You know, you, you could have given me a little, like, that's really one of the best things I've ever done. I've just played it to you. I've got, you know, but, you know, like, and, but that's just part of, you know, like, just what we had to take from each other occasionally um, to keep on going. But it, it really wasn't a big thing. I've got a couple of things to ask you around this period. But, and yeah, I, but I, you know, can I go back to, the, to, to something? You know, like, you know, like, what what did McCartney say when when Lennon played him Ticket to Ride? Do you know what I mean? Would it be much more? You know, when when McCartney you know went round to John's place and played him yesterday, would John have been like got up and you know shook his hand and said that's incredible? Probably not. You know. Do you think that's because you know, you know, half of you is thinking that's you know that's incredible, and then but maybe because yeah, and you know you're in a band to spur each other on. Maybe the other half of you is thinking. Shit, I've got to come up with something. Yeah, even better. Yeah, you know. yeah. I, or, 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 you know, like, like that's what I was saying before. McCartney would just pick, pick up and go, okay, tick to right, it's an A, okay, and just the mechanics of just kicking into, let's work on that song. That's what we are. We're a songwriting team. We've got to pre prepare songs to bring to George and Ringo and George Martin. You know, next week, let's just sort of go into it, and you don't, and you're 24, 25, and you, you know, you know, you're not thinking of when you're going to be 50, 60, and 70, and going, wow, you know, like the minute's gone, you know, like you're working at that sort of say, that time, and so you, you don't have uh, at that age, you're not that generous. Absolutely, you're you're sort of in work mode. It's not time to celebrate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You are. Um, you were he. We touched on this earlier on. And I wonder if you've had more time to think about it. If who was the alpha male? Uh, um, the alpha male between Grant and I. Yeah. Um, probably Lindy was the alpha male. <laughs> uh, um, I, I don't think either of us were. Which is one of the reasons why I think it the friendship survived. I I, I think. Neither of us um, were like that off stage either. Like n neither of us were were that type. Um, no, I mean we 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 came out of the English department of Queensland University. Um, there, I, there, there probably wasn't too many alpha males there. <laughs> yeah, point taken. But um, he. Um, he was un you I think you said in the book he was kind of, he was unreadable in many ways and there was a there's a there's a late on in the book I don't want to give too much away but you you receive some bad news that might have ramifications for you quite serious ramifications mm. for you further down the line uh, the kind the, and um, the kind of bad news that you would sort of be careful about relaying to a close friend 
And mm. I think you said his reaction was a sad and readable nod. Mm. I don't know how much of this you want to elaborate no, on. Go, 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 go. Well, you, you pick um, it up. Yeah, I mean, um, I had, when I was uh, in 1997, pardon me, I took a blood test and I found out that I had um, hepatitis C. And um, which, um, besides the, um, the, the ramifications for my life, I mean, it's a chronic disease uh, that leads to liver cancer. And... Um, uh, we can, um, and so one one of the the I'll just go sideways a bit with this, but I mean one of the things that the, the uh, a doctor will tell you, a specialist that will tell you, as soon as you find out that you've got Hep C, is that you've got to stop drinking, and so I stopped drinking in in 1997, and so that was a big change for Grant and I because Grant was a heavy drinker. And, and him and I did a lot of drinking together in bars, you know, all the way through the 80s. Um, and some of our best times um, were, in, were, were in bars or backstage drinking. Grant was an incredibly fantastic person to drink with um, because he, he really held his alcohol. He, he, he was the gentleman drinker and just got funnier and wiser. And uh, as as he drank, you know, like and and anyone that fell off a bar stool or anything, you know, like he, you know, although he'd be, you know, the eyebrow would go up, and you know, like that's bad behaviour, you know, like but and so he like so a lot of our best times, a lot of our our you know two and three o'clock in the morning conversations about what the band was going to do or, or whatever, or authors or you know you open up, you know, men open up at two o'clock in the morning when they're drunk, um, and so but that finished. That couldn't go on because I was dry, and um, so that was a, a big difference. And and I told Grant, when, we, it was '97. We, we we played here, and um, and I was living in in uh, Germany at the time, and and Grant was in Brisbane. And so I told him on tour. I said, you know, like I've, I've got Hep C, and um, uh, and. You know, he just sort of nodded and looked at me, and it passed really quickly. It it wasn't something that he went into how it was going to change my life or anything like that. It was just uh, he was, you know, like it, it wasn't. Um, and it's so typical of our friendship. Like he didn't go into it. I didn't go into it. He knew what it meant. That and he knew that I I'd, I'd stopped drinking and that I could hold to it. And that he couldn't, um, and, and basically that's what got him um, ten years later. There, um, there's another moment, just briefly, um, where he didn't, he didn't, he didn't come to your wedding, did he? Which again, a lot of people would be surprised by. Yeah, he was going to be my best man. Um, this is this is uh, 1990, and. Um, the band, the band broke up really badly in 89, at the end of 89. Um, Grant and I had had enough. Grant and I, there was a million reasons why the Go-Betweens broke up in 1989. You know, just one of them was that we'd made six albums in seven years and we were about to start our next and we were broke. And, you know, like we were, we, we were tired, you know. If we'd have had, someone had have given us, if we'd have had money to take a year and a half off, maybe things would have been different. But anyway. The band broke up and um, Grant and Amanda were together and uh, she left Grant the day that Grant told her that the band was over and, and that him and I were going to make an acoustic record. Um, and so um, and so Grant, I went back to, to Germany to, to my then girlfriend, um, Karin, who, who, who was going to, who, we were going to get married in May 1990. So I was in a, a German farmhouse and uh, living with my wife and some friends. And I, I wanted Grant, you know, Grant to come over. You know, like he, he was obvious, obviously going to be my best man. Um, but he couldn't leave Sydney. You know, like he, he was convinced that he could get Amanda back. And, and, it was all, and I sensed it, that he, he was almost like if he left Sydney, she'd be gone forever. Uh, and... So I sort of knew um, why he he did that, but um, no. So he didn't he didn't um, he didn't come over. Grant was a strangely immobile person. Like I, I was, 
he was someone who didn't travel much. He didn't have a driver's license grant. And at that time, he stayed in Sydney. You know, he, he punished himself. And uh, I thought he should have got away from the city, but he didn't. And it was also Grant that um, asked you to reform the band years later. Yeah. And yeah. did you, did you, I would imagine it would have been very, irrespective of what you actually wanted to do, sort of, because of, because of the way you depict your friendship with him throughout the years, I almost felt that the sense I got in the book was that you almost felt like you owed it to him to do that. There was a sense of that. Um, he caught me by surprise. Um, we, we were doing a, we we're going to do a couple of months tour of the world to promote Bella Vista Terrace, which was a best of CD coming out on Beggar's Banquet in 1999. And so, and it was just him and I on the road with acoustic guitars under our own names. And um, so, you know, like I thought if there was going to be anything about working further, it would come at the end of the tour. But Grant, after about six shows, um, after a sound check in Melbourne, um, which was the first country we played, Australia, uh, he said to me, um, I want to talk to you. I want to come to your room and talk to you. And his mother had been sick. And I thought he was going to come into the room and tell me, look, my mum's sick. I have got to go back to Ken. And he thought I had something. Um, and so, and then he was the one that broke up the go-betweens in 89 because he told me first, I want to leave the band after practice. And so then I went, you will actually, I want to leave too. And then you go forward another 10 years and then he's telling me that he wants to start the band. So there's all that going on, that toing and throwing, and it, it was his turn to ask, and it was my turn to say, and, you know, wholeheartedly, it, you know, I responded to him. And you went on, yeah. you know, a bit, a, 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 against the kind of the odds, really, because yeah. so many bands that do reform yeah. don't manage to emulate their past glories. No, they shit. You went on to, sorry. No, the shit. Yeah. <laughs> Because, yeah, it can go bad. And you went on to make some of your most beautiful music. Yeah. Um, did it feel like a risk? Or did it just feel yeah, like a Yeah, it, oh. it felt like a risk to me. It didn't feel like a risk, a risk to him. And that's the difference. For, for Grant, it was, you know, that otherworldly cut off from things. To him, it was like, he, he didn't have a doubt. I did. I was like... Um, we're following 16 Lovers Lane, you know. Um, uh, we're, we're starting something that people, you know, love. There's a legend and, 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 and a regard about the band and we're now going to, um, you know, like take it on again and restart it. But I, I felt bolstered by the fact that it was him and me. And, 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 I, and it was just a, an unspoken strength that we had. And so I thought that we could do it. It, it, it was a magical chord. I could just sense that we could... We might do it straight away, um, but we, we'd do great work. And also, in a selfish sense, I had ten songs. Um, I, I hadn't made an album since 1996. So I, I already had half an album written that I could cherry-pick ten really good songs for. And uh, so I knew... You know, I know this sounds calculated, but I, I knew that half the album was written and was really good, and I knew that he could, um, he was capable of writing really quality material quite quickly. This is the period that, uh, like you said, you know, yielded many fantastic songs, and you mentioned Darlinghurst Nights earlier on. Mm -hmm. So, um... <laughs> Can I, can I say that it, it, it contains the Roddy Frank chord? Mm. Um, I, I went on, on uh, the Gov Twins went on tour in um, 1984 with um, Aztec Camera. And uh, Roddy Frame is, is the best guitarist I've ever seen, and the best guitarist that I've ever seen up close. We used to play together. Well, he'd play and I'd watch, because I, I didn't dare sort of play guitar with him in a hotel room because he was so damn good. Um, but he. He, um, he, he had a chord that I hadn't seen before. Fairly straight. Well, it's not a straightforward chord. So all my songs up until 1984 were, were like, you know, majors and minors, minus seven. And, and I'd watch Roddy every night 
and because uh, I was watching a master songwriter. And um, Roddy introduced me. I watched it. He had the major seventh chord, which is walk out to winter. You know, like he, he had, and I just love that chord. And um, so I, it's a, it's a chord that's um, come back into my songwriting every now and again. And I wrote this song in in two thousand and four, and it had the second chord is is the Roddy chord. up to the present tense yeah um, you're now the you're now part of a family which features two recording artists yeah you're talking about my son I am indeed yeah um, yeah he's um, my son a house son carrying my 
son, uh, Lewis is, has got a band called the Goon Sax. Yeah. Who's heard the Goon Sax here? Does it remind you of anyone? No. <laughs> um, there is that, and there is that slightly outsiderish energy. Uh, stylistically, they're, they're a different band, obviously, but the thing that made those early Go Between's recordings exciting, and the re early recordings of so many groups exciting, yeah. is sort of their sort of that must be strange and wonderful to sort of see evolving. It is, it is, um, and although he had. Um, a father that is a singer-songwriter and, and has been in bands and my wife has been in bands and plays the violin, it still seems uh, unlikely that our son would, would, would start a band and start writing songs and that they'd do so well so soon. I, I, I thought that if it was going to happen for him, and he started playing guitar early and he started writing songs early, I, because, you know, it was probably reflecting a little bit through my experience, I didn't think he'd be recording or making a record till he'd be in his early 20s. So the fact, he's 19 now, so the fact, that, and they've just done their second album, which is um, really, really good, um, a big step on from their first album. It must be tempting to interfere, but... <laughs> no, I don't, I don't. We, we keep it very separate and... Uh, and uh, I think that's the way to do it. Um, um, I can't see us being on stage together. I think he's got his thing to do, I've got mine. Um, and we, we try and keep it apart. And I think it's great. It, and, and that comes a lot from his side. Um, and he wants to make his own stand. And uh, I totally respect that. I think, you know, it, maybe it's a part of you know, if 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 he was born ten years earlier, and you'd been the the, the sort of the, the the Robert, the more kind of yeah. loose kind of, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, then there would have been something. It would have been hard for him to sort of rebel against that. But of course, you know, you're more like the person I said. You know, when he was a, a, a little boy, you would have been more like a kind of a dad, a kind of dad. You know, yeah. So. Um, I guess that gave him the space to just kind of experiment. Yeah, yeah, it did. It did. I think. I think um, if you know, like when 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 children, like Lewis was born a year after I had the Hep C, so he he met a very sober dad. Yeah. Um, if I mean, I couldn't imagine my, myself being a father in the late eighties. I was just in no shape. Uh, I was too self-obsessed and too wrapped up in my own ego um, to have anyone <laughs> any that, to be to, to be that person um, so I'm glad that I that, that there was no children at that time um, and so you know like and I say this in the book when when we had children when um, it wasn't you know like you you, you um, read interviews with with rock stars and it's like oh it completely changed my world you know like I you know, a, a child arriving and it just completely, um, my daily routine, my life was completely turned around. I was already there, you know, like it, it, it didn't, I was ready. Um, and so his life um, has been, you know, um, to see in that sort of calmness, um, let you point out, you know, like I was at that time, so he's grown up with a dad that's, you know, fairly, um, besides all my my uh, uh, ways and my my um, attitudes and, and, and the way I carry myself, he he's grown up with a, a fairly normal father, which is great. And what did he think of? What well, either of your children think of your most recent album, Songs to Play? Did they offer a view on what you? No, no, no. Um, not not much. My my daughter was too young. Like um, she, she's on the cover. <laughs> and um, so that's her at I think 13 she's 16 now and she's just starting to get into music now um, and um, Lewis doesn't really um, say much you know he likes what I do but he's always aware of keeping we're very close um, but you know like that's sort of he, he's really good at keeping a distance and and the, the most interaction that comes between him and I is mainly me sort of going, 
um, you know, like I'll say things like, you know, don't play too often, you know, like think about that gig, you know. I'm, I'm more, again, you know, like more of a strategist in a very minor way. I don't talk to him about songwriting or, or what he should do or anything like that. That's hot, his whole thing. So I just offer a few minor, you know, I've been in show business for 40 years. This is what I, you know. And, you know, he, he takes that on board and, and puts it in part of the mix uh, of what he thinks and does. That's a fantastic record, and I was thinking that maybe you might even sing us out by playing something from it, unless you, oh, yeah, you I can will, play whatever will, you like. I know, no, no, I'd, I'd very much like to um, mm -hmm. um, uh, finish with a song from it. is still open uh, and to get a coffee um, I'm going to be um, signing books uh, um, taking question oh um, take, is that man got his hand up there um, I'm signing signing books um, questions you you don't have to um, uh, get something signed or if you just want to come and, and tell me how I can improve um, please do 
And um, I, I want to thank um, Rough Trade, uh, uh, the shop here, for inviting Pete and I along here and, and for, um, for supporting uh, my book. And I'd like to thank Pete, uh, who is amazing and has done an incredible job. It's, um, I, I, I met um, Pete um, a long, long time ago, but, um, but I also met him recently um, at Radio Soho and, and we did interviews together and it was always just an incredibly fantastic time and um, lovely talking to him. So it's really great to be um, oh, thank you. Um, talking to him um, today. And uh, yeah, thank you very, very much for coming along. Give it up for Mr. Robert Porter. Thank you very much. Thank you.